Let's get started. All right. Try a little tenderness. We're going to talk about having tenderness with our teens, right? How do we, how do we help them out? So um, as I said in my 22nd introduction, um, I'm Diana Larson, in case you weren't here the, yesterday morning. Um, I've been working with uh, teams of people and helping teams come together and learn to be effective as quickly as possible for about 30 years now. Uh, and it's part of what attracted me into Agile was the fact that I had already been doing this work, helping organizations understand how to support the teams that they were forming uh, back in the, in the late 80s and early 90s. Some of you weren't born yet. There, um, there was actually a groundswell of movement toward what people called self-managing or self-directing teams turned out that people on teams didn't really want to do management jobs. Who wants to go to the safety meetings, really? You know, so, so that got recast and reformed. What a little known fact, this may be the first place you hear this, one of the um, primary movers, the, one of the exemplars of that movement toward self-managing, self-directing teams, before there was business process re-engineering, there was something called socio-technical systems design. And Tektronics that made uh, oscilloscopes and probes for oscilloscopes and things like that, high-tech manufacturing, was one of the first companies in the U.S. to adopt those practices. A number of the Agile Manifesto signers, when they graduated from university, were recruited into Tektronix. So they learned something about what work could be like. And then Tektronix went through some hard times, got some bad management, frankly. And um, a lot of those folks left and they went other places expecting that teams would be cared for and, you know, and, and discovered they weren't. And so part of that very deceptive phrase that says we've been doing software, learning about how to do it well and how to help others do it, came out of that experience. So I don't even think all of them necessarily notice or acknowledge that. I was lucky enough to be in the same place at the same time, so I got to see that pattern play out. Right? And that is where, um, and then doing socio-technical systems design, proce work process design, which when you take knowledge workers and you say, you, you, you are tasked with accomplishing this kind of work, and you get to design how you think that you should best accomplish that, and we want you to have a high quality of work life, and we want you to jointly optimize your social and technical system and your delivery into the marketplace, and we want you to understand your customers and a couple of other principles. They tend to create and form self-organizing team systems, work process systems. It is my big regret that when I began working more and more in the Agile movement that I forgot that part about having the team design their own process. I thought, XP is cool. Scrum is pretty cool. Let's just teach them that. They would have invented it themselves, but it left them alone. Right? So I go about it much differently now, <laughs> just so you know. Um, so it's out of that experience uh, that I wanted to contribute to this book. Um, my co-author, Ainsley Mees, had a very similar experience in her 25 years of working at Hewlett Packard in the project management office. 
she was one of those really good project managers that didn't let her life or her teams be dictated to by the Gantt charts or the, you know, the, the, the project plan that was planned way too far in advance to know what anything was going to happen. She knew how to adjust. And so between the two of us, we both said, you know what, there's a thing we need to contribute here. We know something about the support of really good teams that doesn't seem to be widely known. And one of those things has to do with how do you help that team get started in the first place? Or how do you help an existing team get started with a new product? So you can start something new in a number of different ways, right? So these are some of the other things. We talked about this the other day, some of the other things that I've done. Uh, lifting off. Where do we want our teams to head when they first come together? Whether, whether the, it's an, a team that has been working together but is now encountering a new product that they need to work on, or whether it's a team of disparate people who are coming from different places, and they're going to come together and work on something. What do we want from them? I mean, there's the specifics of the project, but in general, we are looking for a high value delivery, a successful high value delivery, which, there we go, which includes obviously what the customer wants and will take delivery of and use, right? And that they like well enough that they'll give some, some value back, right? Has to be, you know, the famous, it's got to be delivered before Christmas, right? It has to happen in a time frame that meets everyone's needs as well. For our DevOps colleagues, we want it to be easily maintainable and supportable. We don't want it to be full of bugs. We don't want it... We want it to have as long a life as it needs to have. We want it to be sustained. And it needs to leave the team members with increased capability and capacity to take on the next thing. How many of you have ever heard the term death march? What do you suppose is the problem with a death march on a product? Right, why? After that, you're dead. Right, right. I mean, it comes from a real experience that people have had, right? And if you are dead or burnt out or disengaged or all the other ways that that might manifest, how great are you going to be at your next assignment? <laughs> Where do you go? Where do you go? Right. So, so we want people to do whatever delivery, whether it's an incremental sort of um, versioning kind of delivery or if it's a sort of big bang and now we're moving on to start a new product. We want them to have the energy to move into that new thing and we want them to do that in such a way that they are more capable after this experience than they were before they came into it. Isn't that the ideal? Anybody here want your teams any different than that? Or your products? Right. So, so why, why does this matter? Give me a couple of reasons why this matters. Why we would want to take care of our teams this way. I've, they just fall apart, right? What else? Yeah, you can keep Im you can keep improving things. You can, Im you know, you might be able to to learn something about what you don't need to build, right? The the best software is the stuff that we don't build at all, right? It's the easiest to maintain, right? <laughs> So, so if we can learn something about what we didn't need to deliver, so much the better. What else? 
as we're building, things are getting more and more complicated and we need to know how to engage with that. Okay. There's lots of reasons. This needs a new battery, by the way. Um, so, I want to take a little detour here and talk for just a minute about teams as complex adaptive systems. Anybody here sort of interested in that whole field of complex adaptive systems? Yeah, I, I think that, I think it's fascinating and I think it's a thing that we all are going to need no, to know more about. So, the interest, one of the interesting things about complex adaptive systems, if you go into the complexity research and so on, is it doesn't matter what kind of system you're talking about. It doesn't matter if you're talking about a software system, a wetlands ecosystem, or a human system, like a team, or an organization, or a body, right? They all work the same. They are all driven by the same principles of physics that all the rest of the universe is driven by, right? So, here's a quick tutorial in complex adaptive systems. Every system has a whole, is, is a part, is a, sometimes we call it a container, it's a whole, it, it has a boundary. We can tell what's inside the system and what's outside. So we know what's part of the team and what's not part of the team. And that includes a lot of different parts in there, which, may, which includes the people, but it may include other parts like what's our necessary workspace. Uh, what is the knowledge pieces that need to be within the system, and so on. So those parts can look like very different entities, but, but definitely the team members are a piece of that. And so, and the parts are not the same. Even all the human parts aren't the same, right? We're not all in, that's why we push back against being called resources, right? We're humans, we have different backgrounds, different perspectives, different ways of engaging with things. That's what makes us useful, right? And sometimes those parts, and, and as a part of that system, those parts have to have some kind of interactions and exchanges, right? So that might look like conversation and meetings, but it might look like a number of other things too, right? Um, and, it, and the reason that we need those exchanges is because the parts are all different. And so we have to work, work through those, right? We have to sort of figure that out. Sometimes they're building on each other, sometimes they're not. So if we think about a team as a complex adaptive human system, oh, and the other part of that is that it's, Anybody ever hear the phrase turtles all the way down? It's systems all the way down, right? Every system is made up of these parts, which are each their own little system, you know. My, I'm a human, I have a system going on inside me of my organs and all the, the things that make me viable in the world, right? But then I'm a part of a team, right? And then my team is a part of a larger organization. How many of you ever, when you were a child, wrote one of those letters and put your return address as, you know, you at this street address, in this town, in this city, in this country, on this planet, in this, you know, <laughs> you know, you were just describing all your systems, right? All the systems that you are a part of. So the same thing is true of teams, you know. Uh, you may ultimately, we might think of a team as a part of a marketplace but certainly they're part of their organization that's a part of that marketplace and so on. So if we, if we know that, so every system is a part of a greater system, a greater whole. So we talk parts, whole, greater whole. And this language, by <laughs> I got, um, I got uh, some feedback about referring to Kenevan yesterday morning. Um, this, actually, this way of thinking about systems comes from Human Systems Dynamics Institute and Glinda O. Yang and the work that she's done. 
So there's lots of different ways of thinking about complexity out there, and I invite you to explore more than just one stream, because they all have a slightly different way of thinking about things, and they all will give you new insights based on your own history and background. So, so if we, if we think of a team as a complex adaptive human system, are you ready to sort of say, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll accept that, we can move on from there, right? Then we need to think of the team as that whole. And that is a difficult leap. And particularly, um, I think it's, it can be challenging sometimes for coaches because we get confused about, are we coaching the individual team members? Are we coaches of individuals? Or are we coaches for this team? And that's a very different point of view. And the most skills of us can move back and forth between those because we know when we are doing which one. But there really is a difference, right? If you are concerned with the well-being of the whole system, you might interact very differently with the parts. So it's a thing to consider. But so we are going to think about teams as whole systems and how do we give them the best possible start in life. So, um, so I'm going to ask you some questions and I'd like you to raise your hand and notice your response. Does your product have a committed sponsor and identified product manager, owner, business liaison, whatever you want to call them? Okay. I'm just gonna do this. Can they articulate the business case? <laughs> now we're getting some wavering, all right. Has somebody allocated some funding for this effort? Okay, yeah. What about, do you know for sure what it is you're hoping this team will accomplish? Oops. Right, so now we're not, we don't have quite as many hands. How many of you were able to raise your hand for every one of the four questions? All right, so your teams were ready to do a liftoff. The rest of you still have some work to do, some preparation. So, because teams need this kind of information. These are the basic supporting pieces that we need to have in place before we put the group together. When I um, I went through, I, was, I came into Agile through the extreme programming door. Those were the people I knew, and, um, and I got invited to an extreme programming boot camp in 2000, and I went, and at the end I said, wow, this is really cool work process design. So I was an XPer, even though I wasn't a programmer. I definitely was, was in that camp. And then I started hearing about Scrum and I wanted to know about that. So in about 2002 or 2003, um, I took a Scrum Master training from Ken Schwaber. And he made the statement, and I mean, we've had a conversation about this since, so I'm not telling tales out of school, but he said, you know, if you want a self-organizing team, you take a group of people, you put them in a room and close the door, and they will self-organize. And I was sitting in the back of the room with my 15 years of helping teams come together and develop and went, oh my God, right? And so at the break, I went up and I said, you know, Ken, <laughs> and he said, yeah, you know, last month Esther Derby was in one of my classes and she said kind of the same thing. And he said, I don't really understand that so sociology stuff. Well, he learned. I mean, he learned about it very soon after that. But you don't put it, just throw a bunch of people in a room. They will self-organize, but they'll self-organize to get out of the room, <laughs> right? They won't self-organize to get anything done in the room, right? So what we need to do is provide the conditions that is going to enable that group of people 
to feel like they want to organize themselves to get some work done, right? So, um, so if all your answers were yes, if we we're ready to get started. If your answers weren't yes, think about what you might still need to put in place for your teams. So, at this point in the presentation in another group, somebody said, but wait, wait a minute, I, I got a question. Does chartering and lifting off only benefit new teams? And the answer is no. There are a number of teams, and actually in, in the book, we've got, in, at every chapter, we have some stories, real life stories from real life coaches at the end of, of the chapters that tell about how they have helped their teams come together. And about a third of those stories are about restarts. So no worries if you, you know, if you got your team started and you didn't have all those questions answered, there's, there is still hope. You can still help them by if they've gotten to the place where they're really thrashing, you can stop and do some chartering along the way. Now I'm going to focus now on this idea of char team chartering. It is one of the pieces that I believe belongs in every liftoff but it's not necessarily the only thing you might want to do in a liftoff. And in the book, there's a whole long list. You might do an open space. You might do some boot camp. You might need to do some training if, if the team is taking on the radically new technology challenge. Or, you know, there's a number of different things that might be a part of a liftoff for a team to help the team get started. But what needs to be in every liftoff is a team charter. And so that's where we're going to focus next. OK, now we can get started. So the model. The model includes three elements, purpose, alignment, and context. And it's interesting. A lot of folks will do one or the other of these, or maybe even two of these. But what Ainsley and I discovered was it's very rare at the beginning to ensure that all three things had been taken care of, that the team had information. And there's a reason that we need to do this. The purpose is there for inspiration, just like in Dan Pink's book, Drive, right? Purpose, autonomy, mastery. Well, just like a human is a system, a team is a system and needs its own purpose and it needs its own autonomy. Now we've started talking, I've heard in the, uh, in the Agile world, we hear people talking about autonomous teams as opposed to self-organizing teams, right? So that's still there. So we still need that purpose, we need that alignment, we need that context to get purpose, autonomy, mastery. So purpose is important. Alignment is the, the element that helps us really learn how we are going to collaborate together, how we're going to organize our work so that we can do that. And context is so that we understand our place in that larger system. So purpose is about the system, the whole, the team, and what it's there to accomplish. Alignment is about the parts and how we are going to negotiate our differences. And context is about how do we fit in that larger whole, right? So it takes in all those parts of a complex adaptive human system. The way we accomplish chartering as a part of a liftoff is in two sessions. The first session just has that product side person, that business liaison, and whatever other folks they, they feel they need to have at hand. Sometimes there's some coaching there. Um, because they are answering those questions, those four questions. Do we really know what we want this team to accomplish? Have we funded it? Have we identified the people that we believe need to come together to do this? Or do we have an existing team that is ready to take this on? Uh, all those questions that I just asked you, happen in this session. 
as well as, and then, and then the folks in that session use that information to create a couple of draft documents, actually really rough draft documents, because we don't want the team members to have to start from a blank page. So we give them sort of a straw, do you use that term here, straw document, you know, something, something to react to. It's always easier to do work if you've got something to react to than if you start from a blank page. So that's the gift that this session gives to the team, gives them something to begin their work from. And then the second session is when we bring the team together with probably that product person and sometimes other folks that are key stakeholders if they're going to work with them closely and continually bring them together and now they look at not only purpose but alignment and context we've experimented with this in a number of different ways sometimes we do purpose one day alignment another day context another day we've tried some other things the consensus at this point from team members seems to be they like doing it all in one day. So it's a day. It's a day of investment. The kind of, you know, the Japanese saying, go slow to go fast, right? It's that go slow day that's going to enable them to accelerate into the work later on. So let's look at these elements separately. Purpose. The reason that we include purpose is because it does, it gives that, that motivating juice. It gives the inspiration. It tells us why this work is significant. What's its contribution to the world? Um, it begins to outline sort of the nature of the work and so on. And it helps the team know when they will be successful. What's the goalpost? You know, where, if maybe there's multiple ones, but what are they? How can we, how do we know? And the way we do that is in purpose, we also have three elements. You'll start noticing there's a little bit of a fractal nature to this. <laughs> we look at the product vision. And this is, what is it that the product folks see out in, how do they see the world is going to change? Or some customer's world some aspect of some customer's world. What is this product going to enable? What will we see? Then we look at the team mission. So what does that tell us about the work that this team will be doing? So the team gets very clear about what is the nature of the work that it will take. And that's more of a give and take. Right? Both of these. You know, the the, the work that happened with those straw documents early on is brought into the team and the team looks at the vision, but it, that is owned by the product side. Unless, unless you've got a team that is chartered with actually creating a product. There aren't very many of those. So let's just, let's say there's a product person involved and they know what their product is. They have a vision for their product the team gets to ask questions so that they know they fully understand that vision, right? And that may cause the product person to make some adjustments in it based on the kinds of questions that get asked. But in the end, they're the ones who own that. The team's mission is the product side's best guess at what the work will be, but here's where the team really gets to push back on that, right? No, 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 if you want your product to have this impact, we're going to need to also be doing these kinds of things, right? And then that conversation happens till everyone is satisfied. Generally speaking, I find the purpose takes about, if you've got a day, they, it takes about maybe two-fifths of the day. It takes a little more than a third of the day to accomplish that. But you really want to make sure you've got the solid purpose done before you move on to the other one. Um, and then finally, the last part of it is mission tests, right? Everything in Agile is test driven, right? <laughs> um, so this is how will we know as we go along that we are moving towards success? What parts of our mission do we want to be checking into to make sure we've kind of hit the point 
And it's, a, it's an internal metric for the team. It's not an external metric. It's an internal metric for the team. Is there something we need to learn in order to move forward? Well, let's have a mission test about by what time do we think we will have needed to learn this or learn about this. Uh, some, of the, some of the metrics will be internal like that. Other metrics may be external. If we deliver this piece, we expect we'll get this kind of feedback. Right? Let's see if we really do. So they're little experiments. Right? But they're dr mission driven. They are about the mission. Are we moving toward the mission? And then finally, um, ah, yeah, that, so those are the three. The product vision, the team mission, and the mission test. Who here has worked on a team that had that really clear sense of purpose? What difference did it make? <coughs> made for a better dynamic in the team, right? And who else had their hand up? Yeah. Yeah. How many of you have worked on one of those teams or worked with one of those teams that was put in a room and said, here are some tasks, start working with no sense of purpose? Yeah, what was that like? Yeah, yeah. right. I worked with a, with a team one time that had, was kind of an internal IT team, they're tasked with just kind of keeping the, the wheels rolling, right? And, uh, and they, there, are, uh, there was like three of them and they were gonna hire a fourth and they didn't you know, ever really know. And a, as a part of doing chartering, they identified that, they're, that they were the system reliability engineers, right? That it was on them to make sure that the system was always available. You could physically see in the room their posture change when they had that sense of purpose. It is our job to make sure that the lights stay on. Nobody else is doing that. Everyone else relies on us for that. It was amazing. So it really, it makes a huge difference. So let's look at alignment. Alignment is about creating the whole team, the, that sense of unity. It's no longer a collection of individual contributors. There's an actual team there. And you begin the trust building process. You hope you have a number of people for whom trust comes easily in other folks, but you don't always. And so you have to begin to sort of work that out. How do we, how do we get just enough trust in our professional interactions so that we can work well together, so that we le can learn how to collaborate? And while purpose was about committing to the work, alignment is about committing to doing the work with this group of people, right? To the well-being of us as a team. So you really do need two kinds of commitment when you put a team of people together. You need commitment to the work. This is worthy work, I'm signing on to it. But you also need commitment to the well-being of the team and to each other. So to do that, we do simple rules uh, we do some core team activities and we create working agreements. Simple rules are very similar to the uh, old way of thinking about values and principles, except simple rules come again out of the idea of complexity theory. Every system has a set of simple rules, either explicit or implicit. And uh, the, uh, the classic example of this is uh, if you think about the, what, what are they called, the murmuration of starlings, right? You see those in incredible patterns and clouds of starlings in the, in the sky. How do they do that without like banging into each other and dropping to the ground, right? Some 
uh, engineers at MIT actually simulated that and they discovered that it was only four rules that drove that. that you, can, you can look it up, There's a, it's a simulation called Boyds, B-O-I-D-S, because there was a Boston accent. So they didn't say birds, they said Boyds. Uh, but it was out of that, how many of you seen the movie Jurassic Park? The amazing CGI of herds of dinosaurs? Who's ever seen a herd of dinosaurs? But was that believable? Right? That came directly out of the MIT work. You could believe that as a system because they knew what the simple rules were. Move in the same direction as the rest of the flock. Fly toward the center. Maintain the speed. And in real life, avoid predators. In a computer simulation, that's not quite as important. But anyway, so every team we look for, what are the set of simple rules that are going to kind of guide all your behavior so that any individual part of the system can make a decision and know that it is supported by the rest of the system? So these are like kind of, you know, uber, uber understandings, right? Big, bigger understandings. Then we do some work with the core team. Why have you all come together? Why are you a part of this team? What is the contribution that each of the parts need to make? How are you the same and different? What, di you know, depending on those differences, what does that tell us about some of those interactions that we'll need to have? Where do we, some of us want to become generalizing specialists? Where don't we? There are a number of different activities you can do there. Many of you have done those activities. Lots of teams will start with some kind of team development or team building things, a lot of those will fit here. So it's not that you have to come up with something new. And then finally, working agreements. And these are more daily. These are completing the sentence, we work best together when. We work best together when we all consider these core hours and we're available for meetings during these core hours. We work best together when we run meetings in this way. They're much more mundane than the, than the simple rules. Teams need both. So when you have done team building or team development kinds of activities like that, what difference has that made for your team? Really surfaces those. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right, right, right. And when people are able to even just open up that little bit of honesty, it, it fosters that trust building process. And so people get to work better together. Yeah. So let's think about context. So purpose and alignment we've gotten so far. The last piece is context. Context helps this group of people, this team, see the larger system that they're in. Very often teams have, are never introduced to this. I have colleagues who regularly do chartering and liftoff with their new teams, and they sometimes do context before alignment. Doesn't seem to matter so much. I just like PAC better than PCA, but you know. You could do it either way. You really do have to start with purpose, but the other two are kind of interchangeable. Um, but it helps, you, helps the team see the system, understand their fit, why are they a part of this system, and, and in what way is the system going to support their work, and then what are some of the risks that they're facing, and how can they be sort of prepared to, to adjust to those. How, were very many of you in the session that uh, Claire just did in here before, the way she talked about risk and kind of preparing for those risks, very much a context activity. I was really happy to hear her say that. So the way that we suggest you do that is you spend a little time looking at what we call boundaries and interactions. What are the other parts of the larger system you're a part of? What kinds of interactions will your team need with those other parts of the system? We often draw a big sort of UML context diagram or something like that. Lots of sticky notes, biggest wall we can find, that kind of thing. Then we talk about 
what resources, not humans, but other kinds of things, other parts are we, do we need to bring into this system to effectively do the work? How many of those do we already have? How many of those do we need to secure before we'll be able to do the work? I don't know about you, but I go into, t more times than I can say, I have gone into organizations where the team will tell me, yes, we are, we are expected to do uh, continuous integration and you know, set ourselves up to do continuous delivery, ship at will, but you know, we, we've been waiting four months for our internal production environment build server. Really? <laughs> so what kind of expectations do we think the larger organization has of us and in what way are they giving us the tools we need to do that? And if we don't have the things we need, what's the process for getting those? Thank you very much. Let's figure that out, right? And then we do something called a prospective analysis, which is that looking ahead, what are some of the things that could happen, both opportunities and threats, and how might we respond, depending on which one happens. How likely do we think they are? And you can also do some other things. The impact mapping works well here. There's some other things that you might do. So when you think about things that happen outside your team, what areas of context have impacted teams the most in your experience? Is it what's going on with other teams? Is it things like not getting some of the resources we need to do the work? Yeah. Yeah, do, are we getting the information? Are we, do we have access? In, access to information is a certain kind of resource. Permission to make decisions is a certain kind of resource that we might need. So resources can look very unexpected. You know, not, not what we conventionally think. So the last part of this, we've gone, like I said, TLDR, right? Too long, <laughs> right? We're, we're making a very fast pass through this. But the last point I want to make is that when, after this day where the team comes together and does this chartering as a part of their liftoff, they aren't done they only have their own first draft of a charter. We call it chartering for a reason. It is an ongoing process. Anytime something in the environment changes or anytime one of the working agreements becomes routine, we don't need the reminder anymore, we're gonna wanna update our team charter, right? The thing is, we probably aren't ever going to have to do the whole thing all at once again. We may check in once in a while to say, has our understanding of the product changed? Do we need to shift our mission? Are we, are we uh, meeting our mission tests as we go along? Because they all have dates, right? Um, and ways of sort of measuring them. Uh, you know, have, do we need to change our working agreements? That often is done maybe in a retrospective um, what is something in our context changed? You know, did have has our company just undergone a merger and we've been purchased? And what might that might do to our product? Right? You can have those conversations about the different parts and just update the charter as you go along. Once you have the initial one, but it's a living document. It's never set in stone. You're never done with it until like after the day that the team has finally delivered the last version and you disband. Then you know what the ultimate charter was, but not until then. So it's a collaborative process. It emerges over time. And we shift and change it as we gain greater understanding. And that gives us the energy and, and momentum we need to overcome that inertia of the people first coming together to accomplish something. And even if it's an, ex an intact team that is just moving to a new product, that can, that can be 
a big, big enough change to trigger the need for this. So, Elan, you answered more of the questions than anyone else. <laughs> you had your opportunity, everybody, your hands. <laughs> And, and the rest of you, there are consolation prizes of stickers around, and you can take a sticker. It's kind of fun to walk around with something that says lift off on it, and sometimes people ask you about it. Um, thank you very much for coming to my session, and um, I hope all of your teams have excellent liftoffs. Yeah.